Well, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. And I know some of you are still in the morning uh, time and some of you are in the evening time. So we're welcome again to the Energy Systems Engineering Seminar Series. Uh, this is the third of our Janak Raj lectures for spring 2022. And for those of you who are not familiar with Janak Raj, he was a colleague of mine from undergraduate days at Indian Institute of Technology in New Delhi. And uh, he got his master's here at Lehigh in 1971 in mechanical engineering. Uh, but he went on to a terrific career in investment banking. And unfortunately, he passed away three years ago, but I remember him as a scholar athlete. And so in memoriam to these like to him, we have the lectures for the spring series. Um, this is the third, as I said, for the spring. And I can't think of a more exciting topic than uh, what you'll be hearing today is the role of artificial intelligence and energy transition, the opportunities to decarbonize the power sector with virtual power plants. Now those three last words, the virtual power plant has caught the imagination of the world. And uh, I mean, by, by all means, he's been the pioneer in this area. I remember meeting him more than a decade ago. I think it was a exhibition sponsored by EPRI or ARPA-E, I forget, uh, but he's been in this field. And of course, now his company is world renowned and good job there, Amit. And really, uh, I'm really proud of what you've achieved in this last 10 years. So uh, a little thing about the uh, bio of Amit. He's the founder and CEO of AutoGrid. From 2010 to 2012, he was the director of Smart Grid Research and Modeling and Simulation at Stanford University, where he led an interdisciplinary project to modeling, optimization, and control of the electricity grid and the associated electricity markets. Prior to founding AutoGrid, he was a vice president of products at Magma, Magma Design Automation where he led the product development and management teams uh, responsible for its flagship product. Uh, prior to joining Magma, he was founded the Berkeley Design Automation, a venture-backed company uh, to, in analog and radio frequency semiconductor design and software. And he served as the founding and CEO and later vice president of engineering, responsible for all research and product development. Amit received his BTech in electrical engineering from IIT Kanpur and PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. He has published over 25 papers about design automation, holds seven US patents, and is an active advisor to several startup companies in the Bay Area. So Amit, with, uh, without further ado, uh, uh, I'm really glad that you're able to present uh, uh, about uh, this product. I'm over to you. Okay, thank you, Rudy, uh, for that generous introduction. And I still recall our like first meetings. Uh, I was actually an outsider in the power systems industry, and you were like the the expert. Uh, so uh, I, I feel I learned a lot from from you. Now, of course, after ten years, I feel that uh, I know. Uh, a lot of people in this industry, and I'm uh, more of an insider. But uh, still, uh, given the the the, uh, the 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 large number of people I meet who have 30, 40, 50 year careers in this space, uh, I still feel uh, uh, like a beginner. So thank you for your original support. Uh, we wouldn't uh, be here without uh, the generous support that we received from you and uh, our other partners. And I'm super excited to be here to share some of the work that we are doing. So let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, let me know if you can see my screen now. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So as Rudy mentioned, I am just going to give you a quick uh, uh, overview of uh, what virtual power plants are and maybe uh, if time permits, give a little bit of a flavor uh, on the technology side. Uh, Rudy mentioned that we have a pretty wide uh, spectrum of audience here uh, from students uh, to industry experts. Uh, so I want to keep it 
interactive, but uh, what I'll do is uh, maybe flip through some of the slides uh, fairly quickly. Uh, feel free to just interrupt me at any point of time if you have a question, uh, want to keep it interactive. And then I think uh, we should have a good half an hour or so of, of Q&A uh, towards the end uh, where I can go into any details. Does that sound okay, Rudy, from a... Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, just a little bit of intro on AutoGrid. Uh, we have been uh, at it for more than a decade. Uh, started out uh, at Stanford where I was doing some research, uh, trying to see how some of the high performance numerical computing techniques that we used in semiconductor industry could be applied to power systems. Uh, my big sort of aha movement or realization was that the laws of physics don't change. Uh, and even though the semiconductor chips are tiny, the signals run so fast on these chips uh, that everything starts behaving as a transmission line. And to keep up with the Moore's law uh, over the last 30, 40 years, uh, there is so much technology that has gone in uh, to model every last bit of uh, performance out of these chips uh, that, uh, uh, that we can now analyze tens of millions or billions of uh, transmission lines uh, uh, and, and so uh, when I started looking at the power systems, I thought some of that math and physics could be applied. And there was a lot of uh, innovation already beginning to happen uh, at that time in this industry. So fast forward now, uh, we are about uh, 100 people, still relatively small. Most of our investment comes from the industry. Uh, so we have a number of strategic partners. Uh, we recently announced a round of funding. Uh, where Schneider Electric uh, uh, led the round. And we have globally around uh, 6,000 uh, odd megawatts of assets uh, that we can uh, flex, which means that we can actually control them both for uh, uh, balancing uh, supply and demand and, and providing peak power. Uh, we are operating in about 15 countries uh, and we are expanding rapidly. I sometimes tell my employees that uh, it's been uh, it's been a long journey, but now we are finally at the right time uh, and at the right place uh, in, in history uh, where uh, what we are doing is, uh, is potentially very, uh, very critical to how uh, the energy systems of the future are going to work. So we are growing rapidly. Any one of you uh, looking to, to make a move uh, or, uh, or, or looking for, for jobs, uh, please let me know. Uh, we are always uh, interested in bringing uh, strong caliber. So just, just moving on, I, I'll just flash some images, whether it's hurricanes, fires, floods. Uh, we have seen the, the, the catastrophic impact of climate change. Uh, and, and by and large, people agree that this climate change is getting introduced by uh, fossil fuels. Uh, now, these, the, 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 uh, these weather events, extreme weather events, whether it's in California or Texas, are creating some unprecedented volatility in power systems. Uh, and and I, I won't go into any uh, the spec, uh, details of that. I'm sure you're well aware of, uh, of, of the industry trends. Now, the irony of the situation is that to get rid of uh, these fossil fuels, which are causing volatility in power systems, uh, our best weapon is really uh, using renewables and transition to solar and wind. But in the short term, as we transition uh, various types of uh, conventional generations with renewables, it increases volatility. And again, I'm showing some examples. I'm sure uh, you have seen these things uh, in the literature. The, 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 uh, the, uh, as we all know, the sun doesn't shine in the night. The wind doesn't blow all the time. Uh, it can ramp up and ramp down very quickly. Uh, and that uh, 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 creates extreme stress on the, on the power system because the uh, supply and demand has to be balanced at all points of time, as well as at all nodes. And uh, with a uh, limited amount of storage in the system, uh, it becomes a, a, a challenge. So historically, the way power systems deal with, uh, with, uh, with balancing, uh, whether it's a, 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 especially at the shorter duration, uh, is by using what we call peaker plants, right? So these are the plants that, that are called uh, for very few hours, maybe when the temperature is spiking uh, in a region, uh, they are typically uh, 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 built of natural gas these days, but I mean, uh, there are still a lot of diesel and other uh, fossil fuel uh, based plants uh, out there. Now from a, from a uh, I'm, I'm focusing on this because from a 
uh, impact perspective, uh, this is actually uh, one of the biggest environmental culprits, I would say, and uh, and also potentially one of the things uh, that we can uh, uh, relatively easily uh, replace uh, as part of uh, energy transition. So just looking at some stats, even by fossil fuel standards, uh, these plants are used half the time uh, of a typical, uh, I mean, they're used less than 5% of the hours during the year, and they end up producing uh, more than 10% of the of the uh, of the pollution uh, or emissions out there. So even by fossil fuel standards, uh, these are disproportionately polluting. Uh, also because they're used for very few hours, uh, on an average, they are more than an order of magnitude more expensive than uh, running other conventional fossil fuel plants. And then from an environmental justice perspective, uh, they are particularly bad because more than 50% of these uh, plants are located in uh, 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 economically weaker uh, communities, right? And, and the irony of this whole thing is that they're not even particularly reliable because anytime uh, an extreme weather event happens, uh, either the plant itself uh, could be down or the wires that have to carry electricity from a centralized plant to the population centers uh, could get disrupted, right? So uh, we think that there is a, a, a far better way of uh, providing this type of uh, peak power, uh, which is cheaper and 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 more efficient, and regulators are beginning to realize this. They are they are, uh, If you look at, uh, and I, I've just used a couple of examples, but uh, across U.S. Uh, in many states, uh, 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 there is a growing realization that uh, this old way of doing things, where uh, the fundamental architecture of power systems was designed to carry power from large. Uh, fossil-based uh, centralized power plants to uh, population center is not the only way uh, how these systems can be managed. So there are a lot of these power plants. Uh, there are uh, more than 1,000 of these uh, just in the U.S. If you look at it globally, uh, it's a more than a trillion dollars of opportunity. So it's a, it's a huge uh, problem, both from an environmental perspective, but it's also an opportunity from an economic perspective. And this is just a uh, just some stat, if you just look at top 10 regions, right, uh, there's more than 50 gigawatts of peaker plants uh, that are in operation. And on an average, uh, these plants are used for, uh, these, these plants are uh, uh, 40, 45 years old, uh, and uh, they are op getting operated for very few hours. So these are, these are things that uh, are causing disproportionate harm. And I think it's time now to see how we can uh, find a better solution for these. So that's where virtual power plants come in. Uh, the idea is very much like uh, Airbnb or, uh, or, or, or Uber. Uh, you have a, a resource, uh, whether it's a battery in the home or an EV uh, that is not uh, getting driven, whether it's a part of a fleet. Uh, or at home or rooftop solar uh, or commercial industrial uh, loads that can be flexed up and down uh, uh, HVAC systems and so on, or even large scale batteries. And essentially any, any asset uh, in the energy ecosystem, uh, whether it's on the utility side or on the customer side uh, can be used uh, to uh, provide flexibility, uh, which can then be used to balance supply and demand. And so the virtual and virtual power plant really, in my opinion, is this virtualization layer, which abstracts away the interface between the assets and how they're used for, uh, uh, for balancing supply and demand. So just like you have a virtual machine on which you can uh, use any load, uh, any, any type of like compute uh, resource, and, and now you can move all your compute to, to the cloud by virtualization of the machines. Uh, you can uh, move uh, balancing of supply and demand and power uh, and virtualize it and, and then use it for, uh, for, uh, uh, for, for a more efficient operation. Uh, and and uh, unlike like Airbnb or, or Uber, uh, where you, uh, in case of Airbnb, let's say you have an unutilized home, a uh, room in, in your home, and you, you are renting it out and, and increasing utilization, uh, or, or in case of Uber, you have a, a, a vehicle that you're driving. Uh, with a virtual power plant, you have the same economics. You have a car uh, which is not uh, getting driven, but you can uh, use it for providing grid services and earn extra revenue. Uh, it's less intrusive. I mean, you don't have to drive 
uh, your uh, battery, uh, which is sitting on the uh, on the wall. So it's 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 the self-driving car version of Uber in some sense. Uh, it's uh, uh, EV, uh, especially for for EVs, where battery is the biggest uh, cost of the asset. Uh, if you can use it 24/7, uh, either for transportation when you need it, but uh, in other cases, just rent it out to the grid. Uh, that brings the economics uh, uh, a lot, uh, lot more closer and even uh, 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 makes it superior to, to a typical uh, internal combustion engine. So, so that's the basic concept. Uh, the key to virtual power plants is uh, having a, a software platform uh, that can connect to all the different uh, types of assets uh, that are out there and then aggregate it and, and present it uh, to the utilities and wholesale markets as a resource that they, uh, that they can reason with and, and, and they can transact with. And the challenge here from a utility perspective historically has been that uh, the markets and the utilities are designed to deal with large number, very small number of very large assets. And then they are designed to sell power back to the consumers. Here, uh, you have to deal with very large number of small assets. And instead of selling power, you have you are in some ways buying flexibility. So the systems uh, that they have conventionally uh, 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 deployed are not designed for that volume of uh, data and reverse power flows and so on. And so, so that's where the uh, a new class of software uh, comes in, which enables all of this. Uh, and and from an end uh, use perspective. A virtual power plant is a strictly superior product to a fossil fuel based power plant on pretty much any dimension that you can imagine. I already talked about uh, uh, the environmental benefits. Uh, it's actually cheaper. Uh, it's more reliable uh, because unlike one central power plant, uh, which can be taken out or go out, uh, you have uh, power at the point of uh, consumption uh, and it's widely distributed. So there's no single point of failure. Uh, it's much faster to deploy than a conventional power plant. We can deploy these things uh, within months uh, or even weeks, uh, as opposed to many years. Uh, it's infinitely expandable or shrinkable. So unlike uh, a traditional power plant where you have to spend uh, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars to get the first electrons flowing, uh, you get them uh, up and running. You can start with a few megawatts and you can keep on adding. Uh, it's also extremely targeted, right? So you can uh, you can uh, distribute it based on feeders, and then you can dispatch it exactly uh, where the issue is. And last but not the least, it creates uh, investment in local communities because a lot of these solar and microgrid and energy as a service projects uh, are actually deploying capital within uh, within the local communities, and they're creating jobs in the local economy and so on. Uh, and uh, and now we are just using underutilized uh, capacity from these assets uh, to create more value. So uh, so pretty much on every dimension, uh, it is it is superior, and there's uh, really no reason today uh, to not uh, consider virtual power plants as an alternative to uh, to uh, conventional vehicle plants. And from a uh, from a market perspective, I mean we uh, we have been working on this. Uh, for a few years, uh, we provide the platform, uh, and we have also now added a lot of services around it, so that uh, it becomes, uh, uh, from a from a utility and market perspective, it becomes exactly the same uh, product uh, that uh, that these uh, entities are used to uh, dealing with. Right, so we can aggregate small number of megawatts. Uh, from a lot of different types of uh, what we call partners. Uh, these are OEMs, these are energy as a service developers, solar and storage companies, various types of DR aggregators, energy efficiency players, and so on. Uh, and they don't have to, like, uh, they, the, the, the challenge here on the, on the right-hand side here is that uh, the uh, aggregators and energy as a service uh, companies, they are really focused on end customer and creating value for the end customer. For them to take their asset and figure out how to uh, trade it in wholesale markets or how to offer it to a utility is extremely complicated. Uh, it's, uh, the rules are changing all the time. Utilities are not really uh, uh, known to uh, be fast moving where they can do transactions with 
uh, 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 hundreds or thousands of these small aggregators. So for them, and, and all of them use different interfaces and standards uh, from a data transfer perspective and, 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 and uh, contracting perspective. So we, by, by being in the middle, we are able to offer a one-stop shop for a large number of these aggregators where we just tell them how much money they can make uh, from their fleet and we can uh, uh, provide them that incentive. Uh, and then we can aggregate the power uh, and shape it in a form that it can be consumed by the wholesale markets and utilities and offer it there. And then for, for the utilities also, it's easier because they don't know uh, how to uh, really go after all the different asset owners and they don't have the capability to deal with a small number of, uh, uh, I mean, small megawatts and large number of assets. So, uh, so through the platform, uh, they can virtualize and they uh, they can then uh, dispatch it just like they would dispatch their other large uh, conventional power plant units. So uh, so this simplifies the the transaction. Of course, from a, a business model perspective, uh, we are able to actually uh, create more value than each uh, individual asset uh, can provide, uh, and 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 we we take some margin in the middle as part of uh, of, of uh, uh, making the transactions happen. So just as an example, uh, if you look at uh, today, uh, uh, the, the things which we are able to use uh, uh, in, in our virtual power plants, storage of course has been a big game changer in terms of uh, its ability to dispatch, uh, but you have a lot of other uh, flexible uh, demand, things like commercial and industrial DR, uh, water heaters, smart thermostats, even backup generators in some cases, as well as just behavioral programs, right? And, and the value of stacking this is that no single asset on its own is able to replace a peaker plant. Let's say you take uh, a portfolio of only batteries. Uh, you could do everything that a peaker plant does uh, by and large, uh, except that the cost today is still extremely high uh, if you wanted to replace an entire peaker plant with, with batteries. Uh, on the other hand, demand response has been used in the industry for uh, many years. Uh, but the demand response is uh, potentially behavioral change for customers. Uh, there are a lot of barriers around it. it uh, typically cannot be used for that many hours during the year, but for the hours that it can be used, it's actually much cheaper than, uh, uh, than storage or, 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 uh, or a, a conventional uh, peaker plant. And so by mixing and matching, we get the best of both worlds. We can essentially uh, create a product which on a price performance basis is cheaper than a peaker plant uh, and uh, it can uh, replace a peaker plant completely uh, uh, because it can use storage for, uh, for very fast responding uh, use cases and, and, uh, and, for, uh, and, and demand response for uh, some of the other uh, 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 slower responding use cases. And, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, storage is the biggest game changer. Uh, but I do think that storage in its mobile form with EVs, I think is going to be uh, a dramatic accelerating uh, of, of virtual power plants. And we are already looking at a number of fleet use cases, things like electric school buses, where the utilization of fleet is extremely low for transportation. Uh, but when you look at fuel cost, when you look at maintenance cost, and then especially you tag on the opportunity to use this battery uh, for grid services, uh, the, the fleet economic becomes a lot more uh, lucrative than uh, uh, conventional ice engine. Also, regulatory changes are happening. I think some of you might have heard of this new rule called FERC 2222, uh, which uh, creates uh, an even playing field between uh, what are conventional assets and what are these behind the meter uh, uh, smaller assets. Uh, I think that there is still a lot of uh, room uh, to make this uh, playing field more even. Uh, the ISOs are just beginning to look at uh, 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 the rules and, and see uh, where they can uh, facilitate. I mean, uh, and, and in the Q&A session, I'm happy to uh, give more specific examples. But uh, if you look at California, which is potentially one of the most forward-looking uh, markets in general, uh, even here, uh, the rules are not uh, designed uh, in a way that make either logical sense or economic sense for 
uh, end customers to fully uh, uh, monetize their uh, their resources. So that that's one area that we are uh, uh, continuing to work. Uh, but I, I also think that there's a lot of momentum in this direction. So uh, I think the core to all of this is is this platform. Uh, which has to operate at all time scale, all customer classes, uh, be able to stack all the value streams uh, between uh, what the customers uh, have to see, as well as what the utilities want to see, uh, how, how these assets are uh, traded in the market. Uh, I just want to like maybe spend a few minutes, uh, given that this is a technical audience and and uh, in a college, in in terms of like what is the role of AI and why is this a tough problem and and what we have done uh, in, from a research perspective uh, that makes it a very interesting problem. So if you think about uh, demand supply balancing, uh, you have uh, uh, I mean and uh, like historically looking at airlines pricing. Uh, you have fixed supply, you have this uh, variable demand, use pricing as a mechanism to balance de demand and supply. And, uh, and we have all seen dynamic pricing there. Now you can uh, change it into a situation like Uber where you have both demand and supply that is variable, right? And now you can use, uh, again, pricing as a way uh, to balance both supply and demand, but you have more variables in there. When you look at uh, energy, it's the ultimate on-demand uh, network. You press a light switch and electrons show up. You don't even have to wait for five minutes uh, like you have to for your Uber. Uh, and historically, that was done by overbuilding the supply. But now as the supply itself is becoming renewable, uh, that paradigm doesn't work. right? So uh, the, the key here is to see how we can balance supply and demand uh, in real time at very large scale. And, we, uh, and, and that's where uh, we, we call this thing uh, 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 as our secret sauce predictive controls, uh, which comes in, how do you take a network of very large, a very large network of assets uh, and optimize it in real time and, and control them uh, to make sure electrons get where they're needed precisely when they're needed, uh, irrespective of uh, where they're getting generated, right? And if you look at the complexity of this, not only in terms of number of assets, but the fact that you have to manage both the customer uh, side of the equation, their bill, uh, their comfort, and the network side of the equation, which is uh, really uh, uh, how the grid works and how do you keep the system balanced, uh, it becomes a very complex optimization problem, a lot more than Uber. In fact, I mean, uh, if you think of an, a self-driving car network of Uber, that's a very apt analogy because you are optimizing for not just uh, supply demand balance, but also fuel cost and where do you uh, 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 route optimization and so on, right? So, so, so it becomes very uh, uh, complex. So, just uh, drilling into a little bit more specifics. Uh, this is a typical site uh, that that you would see. You have uh, the site is connected to grid. It might have some solar PV on it. It might have some battery on it. You obviously have uh, consumption of electricity, load of various types, depending on the site. Uh, it's the CNI side, it might have a cogen uh, plant. And uh, all of these arrows are showing uh, which way the power can flow. Solar can produce power for cell consumption. It can feed in bag. The grid can uh, uh, be used to uh, uh, supply power for the loads. Uh, battery can be uh, used to supply power to the loads or uh, 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 feed back into the grid, right? So if you just have uh, five assets, and every asset can either take power from the grid or send power back to the grid. You have two to the power, uh, power five uh, decisions that you have to make. And even if you break this down into, let's say 15 minute intervals, you have hundred uh, such intervals that you have to uh, deal with. And uh, let's say you want to plan it for like a week in advance, you have five days, seven days uh, that you have to do. So very quickly, uh, this becomes a problem which has a few thousand variables and few tens of constraints, even for a single site. And you have to solve this taking into account forecasts of market prices, all kinds of constraints on market rules, uh, various types of tariffs, uh, uh, asset performance, and, and so on, right? So, so even for a single uh, site, the problem complexity uh, becomes quite high, uh, you can solve it, uh, but it's, it's a, uh, a non-trivial problem. Now with DERs, uh, the challenge 
comes is that this site is just one of the many, right? I mean, 10,000 is not even a, a large number. 100,000 is, uh, is something where a lot of uh, deployments are moving to. And now you have to do this, uh, 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 this optimization across this entire portfolio, right? So very soon, the 5,000 uh, site, uh, the, the, the 5,000 variable problem becomes a 40 million variable problem. And uh, the, the, the challenge with this optimization is that it is NP hard, uh, uh, which means that the best known algorithms are exponential in the size of the problem. So if you try to solve it on a conventional machine, uh, typically the breaking point is about a thousand assets. After that, the complexity becomes extremely high and it becomes hard to, uh, to scale. And Rudy, Rudy, you would appreciate this uh, coming from uh, TBA and all. Uh, a typical ISO, uh, in, in US, all the ISOs combined have about 10,000 generating, generating units. I mean, each one of them is, is very, very large, but when you solve a unit commitment and dispatch problem, uh, on a typical ISO, you have 1,000 to 2,000 units that you are dispatching. And to be able to do that, uh, the ISOs typically implement supercomputer class machines. Uh, and even then uh, you would argue that they're barely uh, keeping up with the complexity of this, which, and the cost is enormous. So if you have to go an order or two orders of magnitude higher in terms of number of assets, and you know that the, the problem size is actually exponential in the number of variables, the conventional ways of optimization don't work anymore uh, with, uh, uh, with, with this type of a problem. So this is where uh, our predictive controls technology uh, comes in. How do we optimize outcomes across a vast network of assets uh, using uh, billions of sensor inputs in real time at scale? Uh, and there are three sort of, I would say, technical pillars uh, that we have uh, to be able to do this type of optimization at scale. One is a fundamental role of artificial intelligence, uh, which is to forecast everything from uh, the system peaks uh, to the generation uh, from solar and wind to demand patterns uh, to peaks. So there is a, there's a fairly sophisticated uh, 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 approach to, uh, uh, to forecasting uh, and then keeping track of these forecasts uh, over time for different asset categories. The second big thing which I alluded to is just the sheer scale of the problem in terms of how do you manage data at the scale. Uh, and and uh, so there uh, all the cloud native stuff that is happening, uh, big data, no SQL, uh, containers, high availability uh, cloud uh, becomes really important. But unlike uh, typical big data problems uh, where you have uh, a lot of data coming in, but you might be doing simple aggregation or uh, display. Uh, here you are solving high performance numerical computing, like real optimization. So doing that in a big, big data scenario is not something that uh, is well studied. So I feel that we have done a lot of work in that area to be able to distribute high performance computing over, uh, over, over the cloud. And then the last, uh, but not the least is really uh, how do you make this system just like an internet uh, plug and play and expandable, right? So there are a couple of different dimensions of, uh, of expandability. One is just how do you abstract out uh, the different assets so that irrespective of whether it's a thermostat in a home or a large scale battery uh, that is sitting on the utility side, you can use the same control architecture to, uh, to reason with it. Uh, so that, that, that is uh, easier said than done uh, because some are energy limiting devices, some are energy unlimited devices. Uh, uh, the dispatchability is different. What variables you can control are different. Uh, so, so, that, uh, so that there we had an advantage. Uh, because from day one, we were focused on just uh, thinking about supply demand balancing as the central problem, as opposed to optimizing a one, one specific type of assets. A lot of players in the industry, if you look at it, they will start with storage or EVs or thermostats uh, or water heaters, and they are focused on optimizing the entire value chain there, uh, which is great, uh, which is needed, but we uh, took a slightly different approach. We said that, the central problem is a system level problem, not an asset problem. Uh, and, and how do we abstract and create this virtualization layer so that we can uh, make it plug and play. Uh, so that's a pretty big part of this architecture. Uh, and, and, and then the other thing that we realize is that for us to be able to scale, we'll have to 
uh, meet requirements from all the markets globally. We are in 15 countries, right? So the, the fundamentals are 80, 90% the same. I mean, everybody uses an AC power system and they have the same issues, but the specific rules and specific constraints uh, for different markets are different, right? So we, we created a, a platform uh, which allows us to easily change uh, even the optimization algorithms through APIs and so on, which allows us to now uh, configure it into different markets. So that's just uh, a little bit of a background. There's a lot more uh, that goes behind it. Uh, we probably have one of the strongest uh, teams around uh, applying AI uh, into, into power systems and then uh, combining it with, uh, with optimization. And we are always looking for uh, people who, uh, uh, who have expertise in in this space. Uh, I mean, my own background was not in power systems. Uh, I think power systems are extremely complex. They're not easy to learn, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, there are experts uh, that you can tap into. I think uh, the technology side of things are moving very fast, uh, keeping track of what's happening there and how do you bring best uh, innovations into the power systems is really where we think uh, we add the most value uh, to the industry and we're constantly looking for people who, uh, who can help us keep up to date on those things. Uh, just in terms of uh, uh, impact, uh, these things are running at scale now. Uh, I mean, from our own experience uh, last summer, our VPPs were dispatched close to 1800 times. Uh, we delivered more than 37 gigawatt hours of power. And, and mind you, this is when the grid is most stressed. Uh, to keep the lights on and uh, we were deployed in over 15 countries last year. So, uh, and then this is all uh, uh, possible uh, because of, of a whole ecosystem that we have built. Uh, we don't make any hardware of our own. We are not a project developer. Uh, we are not really uh, financing any of these projects, uh, but the fact that we can be part of this ecosystem uh, and, and, and we can reduce the friction of transaction between uh, utilities on one side and asset owners and operators on the other side is really what enables this type of a asset light uh, business model. So just I'll, I'll leave with a couple of slides uh, and then uh, open it for Q&A. So I, the traditional utility model, one way, capital in intensive, very centralized. It's very fragmented also, by the way, right? I mean, if you think about a, a utility, the largest utility, even though they're monopolies in their own markets, uh, they have only uh, three, four percent market share, even the largest ones like pg and uh, Florida Power and Light, they have three to four million uh, customers. Uh, on the new energy side, uh, these are capital light models, decentralized, they're globally scalable, right? I mean, like uh, a Sunrun or a Amazon, they don't have to stick to a particular market. They can sell solar and uh, energy in, in any market. And it's, it's very competitive, right? So, uh, so like the last hundred plus years have been just building more, uh, uh, more assets, deploying more capital. I think the value now is shifting towards utilization of these assets and optimizing it. And that's where AI and optimization plays a big role. And it's a, it's a, it's a huge opportunity. If you think about what's happening in the industry, uh, from traditional utilities, uh, as well as uh, the ones who are disrupting the utilities to industrial companies and the disruptors there to oil and gas, uh, who are like entering into the renewable market, uh, also looking at energy security. Uh, and, and, and last but not least, the cloud platform guys who are big consumers of electricity, but are also driving uh, the, the technology roadmap. I think they're all converging towards this. There is a growing realization that uh, the status quo uh, cannot continue to work, and uh, and and this is the probably the most exciting time uh, in, in this industry, uh, at least in the last ten years. I think uh, uh, this is definitely uh, the most exciting time uh, uh, this industry. So I'll stop here. I know uh, uh, we have uh, some some time. I went pretty quickly, so hopefully uh, we can make it more interactive. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, that was terrific. And Amit, there's a whole line of questions in the queue, but what we do normally is, first of all, I have a preference to the students in the audience uh, to ask the questions. Uh, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and ask your question. Once we exhaust student questions, I want to go to the general audience. And there are a whole bunch of questions in the chat box. 
So students, go at it, unmute yourself, introduce yourself, ask your question. Don't be shy. Hi, I'm uh, Nick. I'm an ESC student, energy systems engineer at Lehigh. Uh, you said earlier that the algorithms that you're using are very computationally intense because you have so many different variables. Like what kind of simplifications do you guys use to make to make your models actually uh, computationally feasible? Yeah, that's a great question. And maybe I'll uh, jump to one of my slides here. Uh, So there are uh, there are two fundamental innovations uh, that we have uh, done. Uh, one is what we call uh, uh, distributed computing, right? So we have a very sophisticated uh, framework of uh, uh, parallelizing computation on the cloud, right? So uh, use Spark and uh, uh, native uh, cluster, and 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 there is there is some amount of uh, uh, uh complexity in there because these are coupled problems so uh, but if you think about it a lot of times uh, each side can work independently it's only for some constraints and some uh, 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 cost functions where you have to uh, look at the overall portfolio so we are able to uh, uh, decompose the problem and distribute it and then we have a way of converging uh, on the on the overall uh, uh, system level cost function, and in 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 theory, uh, this can require multiple iterations, but in practice, we converge in one or two uh, iterations, and so this way we can leverage the cloud, and and uh, really uh, uh, scale the computation out and make it more linear. The other thing that we do is hierarchy. So a lot of times, uh, even for a user management perspective, uh, you have different types of assets uh, and they think of these assets as, as uh, different dispatchable units. So you uh, a fleet of EVs or uh, a, a group of thermostats or demand response. So we can then uh, create different types of pools and each pool is a collection of uh, assets. So you could optimize uh, each pool separately. And then uh, there is a higher level hierarchical uh, pool of pools optimization problem uh, that we solve. So these are two big techniques that we use to uh, to reduce the complexity and uh, and make it linear as opposed to uh, exponential. Okay, student questions for Ahmed? Unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and ask a question, please. No more questions from students? Okay, I'm gonna open it up to the general audience. I know there are a bunch of questions in the chat box. If anybody wants to uh, ask it orally, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself and ask them the questions, please. Off some of the questions, Rudy, if that helps. Hello, hello, Amit. How are you? It's Andy Zetlin uh, speaking. Hey, Andy. How are you? It's been a long time. I'm glad to see you doing well. Yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> I posted a couple of questions here. Uh, one: uh, Do you also uh, model um, the bump in usage after there's a uh, a period of control for demand response? In other words, when Houses need to warm back up again and or cool down again and batteries need to recharge and water heaters need to recharge, et cetera. Do you model that as well uh, so that utilities know when they can turn things back on? Yeah, we do. Uh, this is typically called cold load pickup uh, in the demand response, this thing. And uh, we do uh, modeling for uh, for load control switches, uh, specific type of assets. We do some randomization of that. We can also uh, uh, release them so that we are not dispa uh, dispatching them uh, and then releasing them uh, as in one go, but we could group them and, and ramp them up uh, over a period of time. So just ramp rate control in general uh, is a pretty big topic. And I think uh, 
Uh, you might have asked about spinning reserves and, and things like yes. that, uh, all related. So, uh, I mean, with certain assets, it's much easier. Like if you have a, a CHP unit, you have a battery, uh, you have a real time uh, second by second control on those assets. So you can uh, shape it very precisely for uh, some, some industrial loads uh, also lend themselves to fast responding spinning reserve type of uh, applications. Uh, but uh, uh, the mainstream market is still this replacement of peaker plan for peak capacity, right? So uh, how do you, uh, how do you, uh, and, and typically you can predict them a few hours, if not a, a day in advance. And then you can use that uh, to bring, uh, uh, bring the right type of capacity online. So, and so you haven't, there, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you haven't seen customers using your systems for arbitrage? No, we do a lot of, uh, wholesale market participation, where if you have prices in the market where uh, uh, it, it becomes a physical hedge uh, to have this type of a portfolio, uh, especially in Texas or in Europe, uh, where uh, a lot of assets are becoming uh, merchant assets uh, and there's an extreme amount of price volatility. Uh, 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 trading desks uh, can use this as a, as a resource that they can trade in the market as well. Excellent. Thank you. It's good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. So, Akshay, do you have your hands up? So, could you unmute yourself and introduce yeah. yourself, please? Uh, I'm Akshay Tagarwal. I'm a University of Toronto Renewable Energy student. So, this question about the size, complexity, and the scale. So, my questions are mostly on the market research. Which kind of communities uh, uh, it is feasible to install the BPP? Like uh, many community, older communities where the less energy consumption. Uh, remote areas, so uh, I believe that there it is not feasible uh, economically. So, uh, so it's a good question, actually. Uh, the uh, and this is where the power of BPP comes in, right? I mean, from a from a uh, just uh, I mentioned some stats on how these speaker plants are disproportionately located in in poor communities, and B, as you mentioned, like typically solar and storage. Uh, are capital intensive assets. So it's hard for uh, people to, uh, uh, people with lower income to, to afford it, right? So, uh, so this is, therein lies an opportunity, right? Uh, by VPPs, we are actually reducing the cost of solar and storage. And, uh, and so uh, the affordability actually becomes much better than if, uh, than if, if you, if these assets were not able to participate in uh, virtual power plants. And we are in discussions with Department of Energy and a lot of other, this thing from a utility perspective, they're trying to see how to serve their uh, this, this population better uh, and how to incentivize solar and storage. And instead of just direct subsidies, uh, this is a market mechanism uh, which allows the cost of uh, batteries to come down. And that's how uh, uh, it, it helps in, in uh, deployment of VPPs in, uh, in, in poorer communities. Okay, thank you. In fact, uh, I mean, there are uh, some situations in which you can pay for an entire battery by just having it participate in VPPs. And, uh, and that, uh, that makes the business case much better. What about retrofitting in the older communities with the old houses? Yeah, I mean, again, the same, same, same thing, right? A, like uh, a lot of these older buildings are getting uh, uh, I mean, if you look at the whole portfolio, you don't even need to do retrofitting. Uh, uh, there, there is this notion of behavioral programs. Now they can't do your fast responding spinning reserves, but uh, things like uh, incentives to uh, reduce consumption uh, when, uh, when the grid is stressed, right? I think that, that works everywhere. Uh, then a lot of these legacy hardware is getting uh, IoT enabled these days, so there is some amount of connectivity and visibility uh, that uh, uh, that you uh, are getting, but the cost is an issue, uh, and this really creates a business case for that kind of an upgrade, right? So anytime uh, you are trying to upgrade, you have to figure out who is going to pay for it, and either the customer can pay for it, or you can get some money by providing services to the others and having a VPP actually creates a new revenue stream 
which uh, just creates more uh, uh, more of a flywheel effect. Because if, if you were going to pay for it uh, and half of that can be now uh, recouped because you are providing grid services back to the utility, uh, the cost just went down and, uh, and it's an opportunity to increase adoption. So Amit, I'm going to go to the uh, chat box and I'll start. Uh, the one question was, do you see virtual power plants as a replacement for all peaker plants? You know, you make a case where you're decarbonizing and this could be a, do you actually look at a complete replacement of all peakers? Yeah, I think eventually I do. Uh, and, uh, and, and the reason is that uh, even with a single asset like storage, you can basically get rid of all, I mean, maybe not all, power plants, but definitely all peaker plants, uh, which are used by definition only during the peak hours. Uh, and, uh, and, and eventually, I think uh, the combination of renewables and storage alone gets you there. Uh, but the cost is going to be a lot lower if you uh, are more intelligently balancing supply and demand. See, virtual power plant is just a just a concept of optimization, right? So in the past, when you have peaker plants, you are saying that is my only degree of freedom that I'm going to use uh, to balance my supply and demand. And no matter what happens, even for like one, even if the supply and demand is imbalanced for a second, I'm just going to build a new power plant to deal with that. And that was fine when there was no visibility and no control over the demand. Uh, but today in the digital world where basically you have full control and full visibility on all the assets and you can scale this, uh, there is no reason to say half of my variables uh, are out of, uh, out of bounds and I'm not going to do anything about it. Uh, you are just going to look at the whole system and see what is the most efficient way of optimizing uh, all the variables that you can touch essentially. And you don't need to touch all the variables, but if you get enough of uh, of these assets, which are underutilized, uh, you can bring them uh, into the overall system. So, I mean, I, I can even see a world where everything is fully distributed. It's a combination of solar microgrids, batteries, and they are networked and uh, they, they, they use to uh, balance supply and demand. It's a, it's a transition, so it's not going to happen overnight. And it's a, not, uh, it's a tens of trillions of dollars worth of transition. And that's why we are going after these peaker plants. Like if you recall my original slide, there are these low hanging fruits, which are just egregious in terms of like age, pollution, uh, just uh, like how many hours they're used. Uh, so those are the, the low hanging fruits that we want to go after first. Again, a follow up question to this uh, peaker plant is, what is your view, how well market designs are being adapted to address virtual power plants? Yeah, I, I mean, I alluded to that a little bit. I think there is definitely a lot of uh, work that needs to happen there. Uh, things like baseline issues, uh, where if you have a power plant, uh, which is utility scale, whatever power it produces, uh, it gets paid for it based on like whatever the market conditions are. On the other hand, if you have a battery, which is behind the meter, let's say in a home, uh, if it is exporting power back to the grid, then it doesn't get paid the same value uh, when it is important, right? So, and, and then sometimes it doesn't get any credit for it. It only gets credit up to uh, making the, the consumption in the home zero, but not for exporting. Uh, and so, so I think there are, there are a lot of issues like that. Also just the telemetry requirements uh, are uh, still very onerous unless you have a big site uh, which can afford that kind of telemetry, it becomes expensive to uh, 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 use these assets as part of a virtual power plant. But more and more, uh, as the cost is coming down, as the adoption is going up, uh, and as the regulators are realizing that these are artificial barriers, uh, there is pressure to, uh, to fix this. And, and part of the reason why we, I mean, if you look at our history over the last 10 years, uh, we were a pure play software as a service provider. So we would give our platform and we would let others implement their virtual power plant using the technology. But since last year, we have also started going out and uh, offering a turnkey virtual power plant. And part of the reason for that is to uh, uh, reduce the friction that is out there. The rules are changing. 
uh, we are helping uh, uh, get DERs on a more even playing field. Uh, but also from a utilities, we want them to look at look and behave as a power plant, right? So uh, a battery may not look and behave as a power plant or a thermostat, but not. Uh, but we want to offer them a product which is very equivalent to a power plant. So we can we can contract it in the same way uh, that they they are used to contracting with. And and these speaker plants are universal, right? In the sense that whether the market mechanisms allow this or not, in a deregulated context every utility has to procure speaker plan because that's how the systems are designed. So that, that is not dependent on market structure per se. Uh, it's a lot more bilateral transaction. And there is still education and awareness and complexity, but uh, it is not necessarily dependent on uh, market rules uh, changing. Thanks, Amrit. Uh, question, a uh, very local question. Uh, do you work with PPNL, which is our local utility? Uh, I don't believe so. I think we have had conversations with them, but if anybody works there, uh, we would be very happy to engage. I see Revis has his hands up. Revis, please unmute yourself. Sure, I'll say, uh, Amit, thank you for the presentation. This is very interesting. Um, I just had a question about scalability. I, I think you have alluded to this a little bit in your presentation, but what, if you visualize the uh, de deployment of these virtual power plants on a much larger scale, like you mentioned, I think 6,000 megawatts in your, one of your opening slides, let's say that was 10, 10 or 15 times larger. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, what are types of issues or if any, do you anticipate in terms of scaling up to that level over the next, you know, say decade or say, for example? Well, I mean, apart from the fact that we need to get enough batteries and other, other DERs deployed, uh, uh, from, on a technical side, I feel that the architecture that we have is fairly robust and it can handle uh, an order of magnitude scale. And the reason is that, uh, I, I think I talked about this a little bit, but the, the key is to be able to distribute computation and scale it linearly so that you can add more commodity servers just as cloud. Uh, if, if it becomes exponential at some point, that's where uh, I mean, you hit a wall basically. And with the conventional architecture, the wall is around thousand real-time assets basically, which obviously doesn't scale. So we have broken that uh, constraint and we, we, have, we are able to scale linearly. And so I think we have a pretty uh, significant room to run here. Uh, and we, we really don't see any sort of technical limitation that at certain number of assets, uh, things will uh, break. Uh, architecturally. Now, I mean, of course, every time you go an order of magnitude, there are new engineering challenges uh, that you encounter. Uh, but it's like uh, uh, it's like Moore's law, right? I mean, like uh, there's no fundamental limitation. There's no physics limitation that uh, prevents us from scaling. Uh, there will be some implementation challenges that we'll encounter. Great, thank you. Another question from Andy in the chat box. Uh, do you manage spinning reserves with AutoGrid? I mean, we do have services that uh, provide uh, spinning reserves and even frequency control regulation using batteries. Uh, uh, and, and in some cases, fast responding uh, industrial loads. Okay. Uh, a uh, question uh, from a student. Uh, when aggregating different buildings within a virtual power plant, how do you deal with buildings that have deferring tariffs? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's where, when uh, I think I alluded to this a little bit in my uh, talk, but I went uh, very, uh, very fast on this. So when, when you're doing optimization, you really have, uh, different value streams. You have a customer-sided value stream, which depends on tariffs that this site is subject to. So we have a, I mean, it, it's part of the complexity, but we have a tariff engine in the platform, which models the utility rates and then sees uh, what are the demand charges, what are the time of use tariffs, what are the export limits and things like that. So part of the, part of the complexity when I was talking about just a single site problem is really to model the rates uh, and various tariffs, uh, different types of site constraints. And that's what uh, starts making the problem challenging basically. Uh, and each, each site has a different, I mean, set of tariffs. Uh, and even, even when the tariff is the same, uh, this is like a lot more in the weeds detail, but because utilities cannot 
uh, typically with the traditional architectures, even calculate bills for everybody on the same day. So they, they have these uh, billing cycles and typically over the 30 days, one thirtieth of the customers are on one billing cycle. So, uh, so, and then if you look at demand charges, which are based on the peak demand for a particular site, uh, the billing cycle is different. So when the month starts is different for different customers, right? So if you don't take that into account, uh, then you are losing money on the table and you're suboptimal uh, from an optimization perspective. So there is a fair amount of complexity that goes in, in modeling, not just the assets, but the environment around the assets, the tariffs, the market rules, uh, and so on, uh, that needs to be taken care of uh, during this. Another question in the chat box. Uh, how do you deal with weather anomalies, extreme weather events? Uh, does your model monitor these patterns? In, uh... Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so the we, we today we only take third party weather forecast and we do build models, but these uh, extreme weather events by definition are. Uh, like rare, so you don't have a whole sort of pattern uh, on which you can train machine learning. But there are two, like maybe different ways in which we are dealing with this. Uh, one is that, uh, uh, that, that I mean, we, we try to model this, but because we are making real-time adjustments, and I didn't go into a lot of details on how the optimization works, uh, we, uh, let me see if I have a slide on that. Uh, I have a lot of slides that I go can get. Yeah, I, I don't think I have a slide in this presentation, but we have two, two types of optimization. One is what we call planning optimization, which works every few minutes uh, to every hour. And it basically does a uh, commitment of units uh, and figures out how to uh, drive this. The other is a much more real time, uh, we call dispatch optimization engine, uh, which looks at various types of contingencies and any deviations from the forecast uh, and adjusts uh, the resources based on uh, those forecasts, and if, if there is an asset which is uh, non-performing or it loses connectivity or it uh, uh, doesn't provide the anticipated power, uh, we can fill it in with other resources that we have in this thing. So having this notion of continuous real-time optimization allows us to deal with errors uh, that we find in our forecasting and then uh, react to it uh, as, as these contingency events arise. Okay, I think, uh, let's see, is there are any, if there are any more questions that you want to ask, uh, Amit, please raise your hands and uh, unmute yourself or enter your question in the chat box. So while we're waiting for a question, uh, Amit, uh, you know, I know the, 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 the DER owners themselves are your customers. Who, who are your other customers? I mean, uh, is the utility one of your customers? Yes. So we actually serve, like I, I, I showed this slide uh, earlier, right? Uh, and so we are working both with the traditional industry incumbents, and mm -hmm. we also work with the new entrants in the space. And I don't know if I have a full, load, like, but, but like uh, typically, uh, let's see, uh, maybe I'll give you a couple of case studies that might help. So, so we work with like uh, an example of a utility that works with us is CPS Energy. Uh, so you, it's, a, it's the utility in San Antonio. Uh, they have been working with us for almost six years now. Uh, they use our platform to manage about 260 now megawatts of uh, uh, virtual power plants uh, from CNI to various types of other uh, systems and, uh, and uh, and, and, and so, th so this would be an example of, of a utility customer and how they use uh, our platform. And they think of it as a, as a peaker plant actually, which they can dispatch. So in Texas, there are a few different things that you can do. Uh, there's something called uh, 4CP, which is coincidental peak charge. The utility pays a pretty high bill uh, on those days when the Texas market uh, is seeing a peak demand. Uh, so they can reduce that. Uh, they also, uh, have uh, they're subject to wholesale market prices where the price cap can be very high, nine thousand dollars per megawatt hour. So they can dispatch that uh, when the prices are very high. 
So, so, so this is one example. Another example of a customer is, is uh, Sunrun. I don't know uh, what happened here, uh, but uh, yeah. So Sunrun is, as you know, the largest solar provider. I'll just focus on this. The, the graphics are messed up for some reason, but you have uh, on one hand, uh, they, they are focused on their customers who are buying solar and you now need to have uh, figure out how solar and storage is going to work together. Uh, and then they're also signing up these contracts with the utilities. So every utility uses a different uh, way of uh, sending control signals. They use a different uh, way of uh, settlements. And so our system comes in in the middle and through a simple API, they just connect with our system. And then we take care of all the interfaces. So it's, it's value on both sides. The utility doesn't want to deal with uh, all these different programs like in the CPS case. So they use us as a derm system and and optimize their portfolio. And then the, the energy as a service companies don't want to deal with 3000 utilities and try to figure out how to sell to them. So they use our platform to make this interface. And if there is a significant network effect in this uh, business. Uh, again, I'll try to see if I have a slide in this presentation or not. But if you look at the ecosystem, it's pretty complex, right? So you have utilities, you have developers, you have various OEMs, hardware manufacturers, you have end customers. And if, if you just think of 3000 utilities in the US and thousands of OEMs, and if they have to exchange data and they have to exchange uh, control signals and settlements, uh, very uh, quickly you blow up, uh, get into an exponential combinatorial blow up basically, right? So, so that's not practical. Uh, and so we come in the middle and we provide APIs to all the participants. So they just see one API and then they have access to the entire ecosystem. Uh, that they can tap into, and that creates value for all the all the market participants in there. Uh, and so, historically, as I mentioned, we charge for our platform, uh, and it is based on number of assets that are getting managed on our platform. Uh, but more and more, we have found that even uh, for uh, smaller developers to go and sign contracts with utilities is very complex. So we are now offering a full turnkey solution where we actually just uh, pay for megawatts uh, and we get paid for megawatts, right? So uh, I think this, this, this is the new business model that uh, we are finding a lot of uh, traction with. So we just go and contract with the partners on this side, we buy their power and we pay them a price. And then we go and contract with utilities and we sell them power and we uh, get paid for that. And then we can do some arbitrage here uh, by mixing and matching and creating the right portfolio. So I meant a related question to that. Now, since you're dealing with so many assets, DER assets, mm -hmm. you have some very granular information about customers, I mean, the DER customers. Are you in a position to even advise them? Like uh, maybe you should be doing this instead of that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And actually we do provide that service to our partners. So our business model today, is not to go to the end consumers directly under our own brand. We go to them under a B2B2C brand. And so, uh, I mean, we do a lot of work with our partners where they will say, we have this customer uh, book of business. And can you tell us what, uh, what can we do? Can we deploy a microgrid? What will be the IRR on that and so on? Mm -hmm. But the cost of customer acquisition is extremely high. Uh, I mean, for every customer, they're buying solar, they're buying storage, they're buying EVs, they're buying energy efficiency. Uh, and uh, from our business model perspective, we don't go directly to these customers uh, because we, we have to build a very different sales force for that. Uh, but we do have the granular information and we do provide our partners that service uh, to be able to help them uh, uh, offer new, uh, new types of products to the customers. Now we have to be careful about data privacy yeah. issues. And uh, we, uh, we don't use uh, the data that we get from utilities to provide that service. Typically, when we do that, we will use the data from that uh, provider uh, itself and then uh, then help them uh, 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 sort of target their customers in a more optimal manner. I see Leo has his hands raised. Leo, please unmute yourself, ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um, so uh, five o'clock in the morning here in Australia. So. Uh, 
up early for uh, for this particular opportunity here, and thanks for taking the time to um, to uh, share your insights with us. So, a couple of questions here. Um, so, um, uh, one is um, uh, the granularity of markets as of late. So, what we're seeing here is markets becoming. Um, more and more granular uh, down to certain markets are trading down to the four second interval, but the typical market in uh, FCAS or ancillary services and energy trades now at the five minute interval to avoid gaming by, uh, by generators. So to what extent um, in this um, now largely renewable world is that explosion in data and more quick computing requirements uh, to provide insights and, and, uh, and instructions across your VPP components is a five minute market setup having and have you come across that elsewhere in the world, potentially in the States? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, so, uh, so thanks for joining uh, this early and uh, uh, I'm very impressed that uh, the seminar has such a wide, uh, wide, wide audience. Uh, I mean, we are active in Australia uh, already, uh, working with a few early customers there. And I would say that the Australian market is one of the most advanced in terms of its complexity and uh, requirements. So, uh, but we are beginning to see, as you said, more and more uh, finer grained uh, granularity. I would say Australia is, is definitely at the bleeding edge. Uh, we do a bunch of work in Europe as well in the imbalance markets and frequency control regulation and so on. So depending on what the product is, uh, uh, sometimes the requirement could be even uh, sub minute in terms of uh, providing flexibility, but may not be in the conventional sense. Like if you are looking at frequency control, typically uh, uh, these are assets which will hide, have site uh, controls that are directly controlled with uh, by by the by the market operator, and then the the decision making is really around managing the droop curve uh, in terms of how it responds to various AGC signals that are coming from the uh, from the ISO, or uh, and and at what times do you want to be participating in in those markets versus other opportunities that you have. Uh, but I I would say the the time sh frames are shrinking in our platform. I mean that is a configurable parameter. Uh, where we can uh, change it based on the market uh, that we are supporting. And uh, clearly the shorter time scales that you go uh, create a much higher burden on compute. And that's why having this linear uh, scalability uh, is, is, is really important, right? So to be able to uh, throw more commodity servers at the problem and, and be able to solve this. Thank you. Do you have another question, Leo? Yeah, yeah. I had one more question. I think um, uh, the other thing that we see down here and it's probably fairly unique uh, to Australia, but as I read, it's becoming a greater issue in the States as well is, um, is system strength. So the more renewable a power, a power grid becomes, the more a short circuit ratio uh, being maintained uh, is imperative. Um, what the market is doing down here is uh, is deploying grid forming batteries that can provide synthetic inertia into the grid in order to be able to more quickly react to um, uh, to say frequency deviations within that narrow you know half a hertz dead band in some of uh, um, uh, in some of those reactive power markets. Um, so, so rather than having to wait for a signal, a dispatch target signal from the utility, really what the battery or the inverter or the power plant controller has to do in that instance is to be able to um, uh, itself sense the signal, the voltage frequency signal um, um, uh, coming from the grid and react, um, you know, in um, hundreds of a second. Uh, to uh, to those frequency deviations. So, to what extent um, have you guys ever worked with um, grid forming technologies that have um, uh, some of that reactive power response cap capability instantaneously? Yeah, we have or, done some small pilots on reactive yeah. power. Uh, thanks for that question. 
Uh, I mean, to your other point on like whether you use AGC or whether you uh, just do uh, local control. I mean, in the in the fast responding frequency control world, uh, typically what we uh, and and we do uh, uh, projects in that. As I mentioned earlier, there is this concept of group curve, right? The dead band that you are trying to optimize for, uh, and uh, like you can uh, create a group curve. Uh, which is uh, which consists of multiple assets essentially, like different types of batteries and and, and so on. So we we are able to uh, like aggregate based on the asset uh, performance. We are able to sort of uh, aggregate it and create an aggregate group curve, and then use that as the market facing group curve, uh, uh, so that you are not using the uh, like in the in the very narrow uh, ranges you are using like storage or some other very fast responding asset. But then, uh, as you move away, you can use uh, you can use uh, some of the slower responding assets as well. Yeah, Leo, good question. Uh, grid forming versus grid following is also a big uh, issue being debated here in the U.S. And I know that you guys have a pretty large project uh, in Australia. Uh, I see that Nicholas had his hands raised. Go ahead and ask your yeah, question. Yeah, I have a question. Um... How do you guys model how weather changes will change renewable generation? Um, did you guys create your own algorithms for that or did you use the work of others? And also like, how does that change from country to country? Cause I'm sure there's different weather data for every country. Yeah, we have a weather dependent uh, model and the, the, the model trains on historical patterns. Uh, so, uh, and, and I mean, I think one, one sort of uh, key thing around our forecasting is that we train a model for every asset. Uh, so it's a very granular model. Typically, I mean, if you have uh, 10,000 homes, we'll be, uh, we, we will have 10,000 individual models for each one of them. And so, so we have a pretty big database of, of these models. Uh, obviously, if you don't have any data, then we use one of our standard models, but as the data feeds in, the model refines and improves and, and trains to that particular site. So forecasting in general is a pretty big uh, topic, uh, and uh, and and I mean we have spent a lot of effort in uh, creating these energy uh, specific uh, forecasting models, whether it's for load, whether it's for generation, and uh, and and you're absolutely right for wind and other resources, uh, depending on where the wind is, uh, like offshore wind in different regions, the models can get very complicated. So one of the things that we do, uh, apart from our own proprietary models, we do ingest third-party models uh, as well. Uh, and we actually allow our customers, if they are very, uh, they already have very sophisticated models that they trust, uh, they can interface those models with our system so that the rest of this optimization can utilize these models. So we have found that, uh, for I mean, while we are good at forecasting, uh, the it's hard to cover every specialized case uh, that is out there. And the best way is to be able to uh, create an open interface uh, where you can ingest uh, yours, but also third party uh, forecasting models. And in terms of weather, I guess, like just one more, I mean, we, we do ingest weather data from a number of services, uh, and then we use that to create our models. I see Leo still has his hand raised. You have another question, Leo? Uh, I, I'm full of them. I do have another one, if that's if that's okay. If I'm not monopolizing the time here, I'd love to ask another one. Yes, go please go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so um, in terms of, uh, of uh, constraints, um, when the dispatch engine um, looks at the bids of uh, various proponents, um, and um, um, I'm not sure if you guys are bidding as a single market participants under the VPP, but let's take a situation where, um, you know, a solar asset or a wind asset is only selling uh, a proportion of, um, of the output um, into the VPP. Um, often in times, uh, there are thermal or security constraints uh, that can limit the output of um, of, of, of an asset. Uh, that diminished output obviously needs to be taken into account in whatever quantification uh, that you guys are doing to be able to balance in real time the supply and demand characteristics. So to what extent are you guys involved 
in the uh, in the seldom easy black art of uh, trying to optimize and bid and rebid behind binding thermal or security constraints. How do local constraints come in and come into the optimization or not? I mean, we have a pretty uh, 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 sophisticated constraints engine. Uh, it doesn't model every last detail uh, that you need to model, but I think it is sufficient for the type of assets that we are managing, which includes uh, batteries and uh, CHP units in some markets, uh, and and and, uh, and and I mean, typical demand response type of events. We haven't gone after like very conventional, like thermal assets and, and things like that. So I think the constraints there would be different. Although the architecture supports, uh, I mean, it's a mixed integer linear uh, sort of uh, uh, model, right? So it, it supports all kinds of constraints and, uh, and, and, and various cost functions in there. So there's nothing uh, per se limiting. But uh, we see bulk of the bulk of the activity is around uh, storage and, and those kind of assets where uh, typically I think the typical constraint apart from the power power constraints that we uh, typically see are uh, ramp constraints and there may be some start start and stop uh, type constraints. Okay. We still got a few more minutes. Uh, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat box or please raise your hand and ask. Amit directly, Amit has been very patient. Thank you, Amit. No, this is perfect. Actually, I love, I love Q&A more than just presenting slides. Any more questions for Amit? Okay. Uh, well, uh, if there are no more questions, I think uh, we, it was just a terrific talk, Amit. And I'm glad I was, had a chance to get a, see how far you guys have come. Uh, you know, the Uber model uh, is, is so appropriate, or Airbnb model is so appropriate, and wish you the very best of luck. And the one thing that I do want to request you is if you are able to share sanitized version of your power, PowerPoint, then I'd be glad to kind of distribute that to the, uh, uh, to the attendees. Uh, Sorry, I was going to ask for more just for good measure. <laughs> okay, well, it's five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you're, you're ready to go. Yeah. Go for, go for it. Um, so, looking at the business model of uh, a now largely failed company and um, um, like um, WePower, uh, what they try to do is is uh, probably a little bit different, but uh, in my opinion, they did have a good idea in the form of trying to aggregate. Um, um, uh, PPAs and um, um, and use their engine as a means to aggregate PPAs and on sell to 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 uh, potentially um, smaller market participants. Um, is there such a vision, or do you see alignment or merit in that business model of um, um, you know? I think of uh, um, um, a, a, a virtual power plant was one model, but. Um, you know, having um, um, and being able to sell that um, output to an interested someone in the form of a PPA uh, is yet another. Um, is that um, in the roadmap? Is that of interest or um, um, uh, how do you see, I guess, um, micro PPAs, if you will, along the lines of what WePower was trying to do? Yeah, I'm, uh, thanks for the question and, and funny that you asked this because this is definitely very much uh, uh, what we are seeing in the market. And, and I, I don't know the specifics of vPower. I've not come across the company, but what we are seeing more and more is that uh, you have renewable developers uh, who used to uh, have 100% of their capacity against a PPA. And even uh, the, the more uh, these PPAs are contract for difference or virtual PPAs, uh, there are uh, there is some risk uh, that needs to be managed there, but more and more the buyers are contracting uh, only portion of these wind farms as uh, uh, in in their PPAs. A lot of these PPAs are getting expired, so they're becoming more merchant wind farms. And on the buyer side, you see a lot more movement towards 24/7 carbon-free energy. So instead of just balancing their annual 
demand with uh, PPA is they want to balance it on an hour by hour basis. So we do see a lot of uh, 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 need for flexibility management uh, in terms of PPA uh, management, both on the IPP side, like independent power producers who are building the projects and they want contracted revenue, as well as on the buyer side who are trying to figure out their risk of multiple PPAs and how they manage all of this. And I think flexibility management, certainly uh, the ability to add batteries uh, along with renewables and then do some on-site generation and on-site uh, demand management is uh, uh, an integral part of this 24 seven carbon free uh, energy, which uh, I think uh, Google has been taking the lead on that in terms of uh, driving the conversation, but all the different data centers uh, are now uh, looking at it and trying to see how they uh, they need to take a broader view of optimization, right? So, so I mean, we from day one, we, we have been like uh, focused on what we call flexibility management, right? BPP, as you correctly said, is one way of monetizing flexibility, uh, but the key is balancing supply and demand. And uh, and we, we have taken a fairly broad view of, of, of the problem statement in that sense. Okay. Um, so I think we're coming near the end. And uh, again, thank you, Amit. And uh, if you can share any part of your presentation, uh, I'd be glad to distribute this for the, to the students and the audience. Uh, but two weeks from now, we'll have a speaker from NASDAQ talking about how valuation now takes into account ESG metrics. And so she's a, a student from Lehigh. Uh, March 21st, please mark your calendar, 12 noon. Eastern time. And uh, thank you again, Amit. And what a great presentation, a lot of interesting information. I'm sure the uh, students uh, would be very motivated to get into this, this area of business. Uh, yeah, thank you, Rudy. My pleasure. Uh, this was a great interaction. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are always uh, uh, looking to bring exceptional talent to the team. Uh, please feel free to re uh, reach out to me. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if everybody has my email. It's amit at auto-grid.com. Uh, I should have put it on the slide. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, provide any extra information, and I will uh, work on uh, creating a version of the slides uh, that can be circulated. All right. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Amit, uh, for your presentation, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.